Hey, good morning, everybody. Do want to definitely remember 9-11. Uh, we all remember where we were if we were alive then, and we can't ever forget. It rocked our world, as, as uh, Dave reminded us, and um, can't ever forget. Can't ever forget the preciousness of life, the sacrifice of amazing, beautiful people, and um, that our world is very evil in so many ways, but yet God's so good. That's why we're in a series called, why we call it The Good News. So the gospel, what is it? The thrust of this series is really to understand the different dimensions of the gospel. And so last week I explained that the gospel literally means good news and that the good news is all about Jesus Christ, not about us, it's all about Jesus. And what makes it good news for us is that Jesus Christ came to earth as God and man. He sacrificed his life on the cross and that we embrace that by faith and faith alone We have eternal life. That's good news. It's not something we do. It's not human goodness. It's not religiosity, not even going to church, not even reading the Bible, not even giving. It has nothing to do with it because that's all the earning perspective of eternal life. You don't earn eternal life. We don't sing amazing earned, look how good I am. We sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like you and I. And so that's why we call it good news, because we can be forgiven by the grace of God through the sacrifice of Christ and have eternal life. I don't think there could be any better good news than to hear that your sins can be forgiven. And my hope is that those online, those here, every one of you will receive the good news and uh, be a Christian and have eternal life. Now today I want to build off last week and I want to answer a very important question. Is the gospel something that you believe and receive, which we already defined it is, is is the gospel something you believe and receive, it's kind of one and done and that's it? Or is the gospel something that goes beyond when you receive Christ and is something you live out the rest of your life? So fundamentally, is the gospel just something that happened in the past Or is the gospel something that also happens in the present and also happens in the future? What do you think? Don't answer out loud, but what do you think inside? Take out your notes and we're going to look at some verses. You probably know with all those verses, the answer is probably not. It's just in the past. (laughs) But just to settle it, I want to look at a couple verses to help you understand this concept. Romans 1.16 was a verse we looked at last week and The Apostle Paul says, the gospel is the power of God. So it's all about God. It's all about what God did. It's not about what you do. It's not about how good you are. Your moral goodness has nothing to do with gaining eternal life. Because the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. Salvation from what? From our past failures from our present struggles, and from our future destiny, the penalty, power, and punishment of sin. He saves us from everything that sin brings, and this is given to everyone who what? Believes, and we said it's not just believe intellectually, right? Not everybody says Lord, or we're going to see that in a minute, but it's also somebody who receives. So here's the big idea. The gospel brings salvation. I mean, For 99% of you, that's so basic. But maybe for some of you, it's new. But I want you to understand, the gospel brings salvation. Now, I want to look, since the gospel brings salvation, when does salvation take place? We know it takes place in the past, the moment you believe, but does it take place, to my original question, does it take place in the present and the future too? So in other words, does the Bible teach if you become a Christian, you were saved? Or does the Bible teach you were saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved? So what do you think, A or B? Well, look at this verse, Philippians 2.12. Apostle Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Continue to work out, that's present tense, your salvation. We already said the gospel is the power of God for salvation. So the gospel is salvation. 
And salvation is to be worked out. Therefore, the gospel is to be worked out. So what does that say? The gospel is something that happens in the past. And there has to be a starting point. Not everybody's going to heaven. Jesus said most people are not going to heaven. A f- only a few will. But it's not just something that happens in the past, like you are saved. It certainly does. You have to have a point in time you are saved. You become a Christian. But it's also something that you continue to work out. And, of course, one day you're going to die. So it's not only present, it's also what? Future. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So clearly the gospel is both something you believe and receive at a point in time in the past, but also something you live out every day of your life. And here's the thing. If the gospel is something that's in the past and in the present and in the future, then guess what? It was just as good news when you believed in the past, and it should be just as good news to live out the gospel in the present, and it should be just as good news to live out the gospel in the future. Does that make sense? Because a lot of people go, well, you know what? I, I accepted Christ in the past, and, and I don't really live it out. I don't go to church. I don't read the Bible. I certainly don't give money to the church. Church is corrupt. They don't know how to spend money. You know, I spend it on myself because I know where it's going, you know, et cetera, et cetera. People do all of that, right? And, and, and what they basically said is, I accepted Christ for fire insurance. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I don't want to go to hell. So just, I have people like that. Like, I, like, I don't want to go to hell, so I accepted Christ. But I, and I'm, and I'm going to ask the question, uh, you better be careful that <laughs> if that's your thinking, that you really accept Christ. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. It's critical that we live out the gospel. If you live out the gospel after you believe and receive Christ, it'll provide three benefits. It'll provide a benefit in the past, obviously, a benefit in the present, and then also a benefit in the future. And that's kind of the structure of what I want to talk to you about. It'll take care of your past sins, obviously, your present struggles, and also your future destiny. And... Um, That's how you live out the gospel every day. So the more you live out the gospel every day, the more it begins to change your life. But I want to dispel a myth. And and this is not the Christian life. The Christian life is not this. I accept Christ and every day I live better for him every day. I I would love for that to be. That's how we wish it would be, but it's not. Here's the Christian life for most of us. It's up and down, but, you know, any given day, you could be worse than the day before, which is not the ideal, but the more you live for the Lord, what happens? Over time, you're living it out better. Now, day to day, you may struggle, but over time, you're living it out better. We like to say this here at Lakeshore, it's not about perfection. It's all about direction. See what I'm saying? That you're, that Maybe in a given day, you weren't better than yesterday, but week to week, month to month, you're getting closer to God and you're living out. Does that make any sense? All right, so what I want to do is I want to use the past, present, future construct to give you the the three benefits of living out the gospel because it's not just something in the past. But we're going to start with the past, and that's this. The first benefit of living out the gospel is we will know that God really did save us. So I have a question. Do you think that everybody who says they're a Christian really is. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? Jesus said things like, there will be wolves in sheep's clothing. He said many things like that. False teachers in the church. Um, Almost all the New Testament was, at least a majority of it, was written in response to some false teaching that came into the church. No. Why is that? Number one, because some people think they received Jesus, but they don't understand Jesus. Like, I, I forget which one it was, some porn hustler guy uh, that um, allegedly accepted Christ, and then a Christian went up to him and said, you gotta, if you accepted Christ, you've got to stop selling these smut magazines. And he said, well, if, if that's what it, then, then I didn't accept Christ. No, you didn't, <laughs> not at all. Because the Christ you accepted uh, condemns the objectification of human beings, and especially women. And so sometimes you accept the false Christ. And here's another one. 
sometimes people who say a prayer, like, I, I said the prayer. Well, you don't live the prayer, really. But just because you said the prayer, you didn't really mean it. How many know you can say a prayer and not really mean it? It's so true. It is so true. And so that's why um, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 13.5. It's so important. Let's look at this. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Now, he's talking to Christians. I mean, it's 2 Corinthians, the, the church at Corinth. And he's saying, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. In other words, just because you're in the church, it doesn't mean you're a Christian. Examine yourselves. Test yourselves. So he says, examine yourselves. Look inside yourself and ask, did I really truly accept Christ by faith alone? And then test yourselves. Now, if, instead of looking inside, which is examine yourself, test yourself is look outside of yourself and ask, am I really living a new and changed life? Like, if I accept Christ, am, am I changed? And then Paul adds at the end, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So if Christ is in you, you're a Christian. If Christ is not in you, you fail the test. And it's just important. Now, here's a big question. Since we receive Christ by faith alone, um, what role does good works play? Because, like, we don't say... Accept Christ and that's it. Live how you want. We, we say accept Christ and then live for him, right? We say live for him, live the right way. We say all those things, right? So what role does good works play with faith? Jesus answers the question in, in Matthew 7, 21. In the, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says this. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. If I come up to a tree and I see big juicy oranges or more for our climate here, apples, and you, and you go, well, that's an apple tree because it has apple as fruit, it has orange as fruit. You tell a tree by its fruit. What's Jesus saying is whatever something produces, whatever comes out of that reveals what it is what's inside it. And then he uses that metaphor, that agricultural metaphor, and he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, let's stop right there. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot think of some, anything more horrifying than Dying, standing before Jesus, thinking you're a Christian, and then Jesus says, um, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to... So you go, oh, Lord, I'm so glad to see you. And in time, we realize it's not good. Jesus says it. It's going to happen. There are going to be people who think that they're Christians that stand before a holy, living God. Jesus Christ is a holy, living God. And they are going to, if you've ever got the worst news in your life, it's infinitely worse. It's like the bottom drops out in your life and you go, I'm going to spend eternity apart from Christ. Horrifying feeling. But then he says something interesting. But only the one who puts his faith alone in me alone. No, he didn't say that, did he? He says, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Ooh, Jesus, you, you and Paul are, are, don't agree because Paul said it was by faith alone. You're saying it's by good works. But Jesus is basically saying this. Not everybody who says they are a Christian, thinks they are a Christian, presumes they are a Christian, really is one. Jesus is saying the way you know that you had true faith is through good works. The way you know you have true faith is through good works. Good works have nothing 0.0 .0 to do with getting to heaven. 
Good works, like I said last week, do a lot of things. They determine your reward in heaven if you are a Christian. But here's another thing. Good works prove that that prayer you said back then, that that faith you extended toward Christ alone, through faith alone, back then, is true. It's the only way you can know an orange tree is an orange tree, by the oranges. The only way you can know a Christian is a Christian is by good works. That's the only way you can know. Faith alone saves us. Good works after that confirms that we are saved. Does that make sense? A dreary day. Are you all right? All right. I'm just... If I can use Jesus' metaphor, faith alone is the root. What makes an orange tree an orange tree? That seed germinated, spun around, and produced the tree. The root is what shows it, but the fruit is what we see. An orange tree is not an orange tree because it produces orange oranges. An orange tree will produce oranges, if that makes sense. Kind of made sense. Anyway, so you know what I'm saying. It is impossible... Here's, here's what I want. It is impossible, impossible for someone to become a Christian and not produce life-changing good works. It is impossible. It can happen. The amount of good works will vary. God has not called us to necessarily be fruit inspectors, but it will happen. So, how will knowing that we have really believed change us? Well, here's the first takeaway. It's about the past. We will have a confident assurance of salvation. We will know that we 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 have eternal life. By the way, the Bible, if you take Discover Christianity, which is starting in a few weeks, um, you'll learn the first session is what it means to be a Christian. We present the gospel. Session two, this is for new believers, for pre-Christians, or for anybody who's never gotten the basics. In week two, we talk about assurance of salvation. Romans 8 talks about how the Holy Spirit gives us the I know that 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 I know assurance. Well, so do good works. Imagine it. No more doubts. I'm going to heaven. No more what ifs, no more am I really a Christian, no more did God really forgive me. All of that's in the past when you live out the gospel. Notice 2 Timothy 1.9, he has saved us. That's the most obvious tense of salvation. And then 1 John 5.13, if you notice there's a one in front of John, so it's not the gospel of John, it's 1 John or 1 John, it's the epistle of John. And in 1 John 5, 13, this is the memory verse for, um, I think, session two of Discover Christianity, where John writes his letter at the end. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, if a Christian has eternal life and he knows it, that's assurance. By the way, if you know you have eternal anything, you're not losing it. You ever hear people say that, well, you could lose your salvation. Well, how do you lose eternal? Explain that to me. How do you lose eternal life? Well, he uneternals it. No, he never would have given you eternal. It's crazy. When I became a Christian, I had no one to help me. So the, the story, it was the first weekend of RIT, September of 1983. A friend came up, fired up, told me about Jesus Christ, and I knew, I knew he, what he was saying was true about, you know, we, had, we grew up in a certain tradition that did not teach us that way, and, and he, he taught it. But it took me a couple months. And then a couple months later, I was watching TV, and I was listening to this um, TV teacher teach about the end times, and I got, I was scared to tar out of me. And then he said, but you, you don't have to go through that. And, and he, he started to explain how you become a Christian. I go, oh my goodness, he was talking to Joel. He must know my friend Joe. Like, because they're like saying, this, he said the same thing as Joe. Well, it's because it's called the Bible, right? So I accepted Christ. And I, and I told you I had some Hawaiian pot and I dumped every flake out of it. It was, it was very expensive, but it, every, it was like a joy, honestly, an absolute joy. It was the uh, biggest waste of money that I had so much joy about in my life, honestly. 
But then I didn't have anybody with me to help me. Like, so the next day I said, well, like, did I mean that? So I accepted Christ again. A couple days later, did I mean that? And I accepted Christ about, I'm probably overstating it, but about 10 times. I mean, I, I just wanted to be sure. But here's the thing. My life was changing beyond the flush in the pot down the toilet. My life was changing. I wasn't perfect. Believe me, I'm still not. Um, but my life was changing, and that helped me see that God was at work in my life. And what did that do? Gave me assurance of salvation that in the past, I really am a Christian. Do you know that? Do you know that you're a Christian with 100% certainty? Do you know that God really did save you or... Do you want to know that he can? Do you have assurance of salvation? The only way to truly know is to live out the gospel and see God do good works in your life that you didn't see before. By the way, another sign is that good works in your life that you would have never imagined you would do. I see people from high school sometimes. I think, I think Tony's there. Tony, great to see you, buddy. Hung out Friday night with some high school friends. And I've seen high school friends, and they go, like, you're different than high school. Like, you're like a different cat. I, I'm a totally different cat. Meow. All right, so second benefit of living out, the, just trying to lighten it up. Second benefit of living out the gospel is we will grow like God fully wants us to. A true Christian will begin to desire new things in their life that they didn't before. You want to do more of what God wants you to do, and you want to do less of what you used to want to do that was crazy. And sinful. Not 100%, but increasingly, right? As a result, you mature and grow to be the person God wants you to be. Hebrews 6 1 talks about this. The author, unknown to us, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, one of the few books we just don't know. He says this So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. There's so many Christians that all they know are the basics. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's about the limit of their Bible knowledge, right? They know A, B, C, D of Christianity, but P, Q, R, S is foreign to them. They just know ga, ga, goo, goo, baby stuff. And the author says, let's stop going over the basics. He's not saying it's, it's not important to go over the basics. He's saying, let's, let's stop making our full agenda going over A, B, C, D, let us instead go on to maturity in our understanding. And it all starts with teaching. When you grow like God fully wants you to grow, it's not everything, because knowing isn't doing, but knowing is the basis for doing. It's all about this. The more I know this, and the more God's at work in my life, the more I live it out. Now, there are biblical eggheads. They quote scripture like crazy, and they don't live it out. Not I don't have an answer for that, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. Look at 1 Peter 2.2. 2. He, he says it this way. He says, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word. That The word is a term for the Bible. It's short for the word of God because the Bible is the word of God. So when he says the word or you hear, man, preach the word, you know, what, what they're saying is the word of God or the Bible. Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that... As a result, you may grow in respect to what? Salvation. Because it's not just a past thing, it's a what? It's a present thing. So on the one hand, you, you, you can't give a newborn baby a petite sirloin, right? On the other hand, it would be queer to see a teenager <laughs> walking through the mall or or a department store with a baby bottle. Equally queer. And so the point is, you should be eating, taking in God's word, commensurate to how long you've been in the faith. Does that make sense? You, you, you know, I don't expect a new Christian to digest the sovereignty of God. <laughs> He's just trying to understand what happened to me. It's only natural that as you grow in your faith that you crave more and more of the meatier things of the Bible. I see this in so many of you here. I love our church. <laughs> I cannot remember the last Sunday I left here anything but happier. I see you. 
I see God at work in your life. I'm so proud of you. I mean, we're all a mess, right? But we're all getting less messier wherever we are. I love that about our church. I love it, love it, love it. And it's because it all starts when we want to know more about the Bible. That's why we're here today. And yet, sadly, the truth is, some really, some people who say they're Christians just don't hunger for the Bible. Go to church, eh, whatever, if I feel like it. Um, read the Bible on your own daily. I don't understand. I don't read that. I mean, it's just troubling. I'm so thankful we have so few of that here. But when we're hungry for God in the Bible, we grow in the gospel of Christ. And when we grow in the gospel of Christ, we become the kind of people not only God wants us to be, I think that's pretty obvious. Here's the thing. When you grow in your faith and you grow and live out the Bible, you become the person you really want to be. You may not have thought you want to. I never thought I'd want to be a pastor. I was a knucklehead at 22. But I couldn't, I, I think about this all the time, I, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else because I think God called me to it. I mean, let you be the judge of that. So how will growing, because verse, verse is knowing, this one's about grow, how will growing like God fully change us? And here's the second thing. This is the present. It will give us a continual appreciation of salvation. The more you grow in your faith, the more you live out the gospel, you will appreciate that God saved you. You'll say this, I cannot believe that God forgave me. I cannot believe that Jesus loved me enough. I cannot believe Jesus took the agonizing torture, not only of the cross, but all that led up to it. I cannot believe Jesus voluntarily laid down his life. I cannot believe he loves me. I cannot believe that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. I cannot believe that he would want me in his life. I cannot believe I am forgiven. I cannot, you just go on and on and on and on with appreciation. How could we appreciate God enough? How? I think there's a great hymn, I know there's a great hymn, I don't think, I know, that says, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. A thousand isn't enough. Ten thousand aren't enough. How could we appreciate God enough? The only way you appreciate it is to live it out, to grow. The more you grow, the more you'll want to read the Bible, the more you'll, want, you'll read the Bible, the more you'll appreciate what Jesus did for us. And it makes life a lot better, I'll tell you that. You'll love him more than money. You'll love Jesus Christ more than things. You'll love Jesus Christ more than your career trajectory. You'll love Jesus Christ more than person. You'll love Jesus Christ more than your spouse. And I love my spouse, but... I love Jesus more. And all that can be yours in the present because 1 Corinthians 1.18, to us who are being saved. So there we said, you were saved. Now this text says, we are being saved. Isn't that interesting? We're being saved. Every day we walk as a Christian, we are experiencing the salvation process in the present. It helps you in the moment. So what I want to do is just cover a string of things that, that the good things that happen, why, why um, you will appreciate, your, how you know you'll appreciate salvation. Here's the first. You, you'll love going to church every week because you become like David in Psalm 122.1 where David said, I was glad. I was glad when they said to me, let's go, <clears throat> let's go, <clears throat> let's go to the house of the Lord. Now, I grew up in a tradition, went to church a little bit as a kid, then we didn't go, and my parents separated and, and, and eventually got divorced, and then I started going to church every week. My dad would take me to church every week, but man, I did not want to go. I knew I was supposed to go. I went because I was supposed to go. How many know what I'm talking about? I went because I was supposed to go. 
So me and my brother, I don't think my dad so much, but me and my brother had a, had a strategy to try to minimize this 45-minute service to like about 30. So we'd come in a little late. Then we'd go through the service, and then communion was offered at the end of the service, and then there'd be a little bit more service afterward. But we'd take the communion, and we knew we were supposed to pray and ask for forgiveness of our sins. So we'd take the communion, and we'd pray all the way out to the parking lot. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, the, for getting us out. I mean, for forgiving. I mean, I just, I didn't want to be at church. I just did it because I had to. But David says, man, when you're a Christian, you're glad. Not I was mad, I was sad, I was had, it was bad, it was a fad. I was glad. In Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, that's the other reference there. It just says, part of it is encouragement. When you come to church, you will get encouraged. At least you should. Doesn't mean you don't get challenged also. You should, but also encouraged. But then also, here's another thing. You get to encourage other people. See, the church should be a mutual encouragement environment. Here's another one. When you are being saved and you are growing then look at what happens. You start loving the Bible. Look at Psalm 1, 1 to 2. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. That's an Old Testament expression for the Bible as it was revealed to that point, which would be most of the Old Testament at this point in history. And who meditates on his law or the Bible, watches day and night. Just make a habit out of it. Doesn't mean if you don't read it. I mean, I, I, I read it a lot because I work here, but I was telling the staff, Wednesday, we kind of had this annual thing, and we talk about, hey, the year ahead. And I just told the staff, we have to make sure that we are reading the Bible ourselves for ourselves daily. Not, well, I read the Bible in preparation for Sunday. That's easy for me to just say, but it's not what God wants. He wants me to read the Bible for me, and then later I'll read the Bible for you, right? And for us, really, because it helps me too. And you just love that. You just appreciate that. And then you realize the importance and the power of prayer. Look at Romans 12 too. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You go, man, how, how do I find joy? How do I find hope? Prayer. How do I find patience and affliction? Prayer. What does prayer do? It gives me hope and patience. I mean, prayer is everything. Prayer is not preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. Prayer is the thing. And they all go together. Now, early on in my faith, I appreciated my salvation. But again, like I said, I really didn't know what God wanted me to do. So in time, um, I'd been going to the church I'd grown up in for about a year. And in time, the, my friend Joe helped me become a Christian. He, he, he saw me. He goes, well, where are you going to church? I said, this, this church. And he said, you want to go to a church that's, that teaches the Bible overtly. And so Bible. And my wife and I went, and we were like David, and we were like Psalm 122. We were glad. We would go to church every week. Loved it. Loved it. Hungry. And I didn't know how to read the Bible, and I didn't know where to start. And then a friend, I was working as a technical lab assistant at RIT, um, getting free tuition, which that was pretty cool. And I'm um, working on my engineering degree, so I would, I would be a lab assistant for some of the labs for classes I had taken as an engineer, engineering student. And one of the other guys who was working out as master's was there too, and he helped me learn how to read the Bible. So I became like the Psalm 1 guy. I started delighting it. I started reading it day and night. By the way, it was so cool. Last Sunday, a lady came up to me and said, I... I, I I want to read the Bible. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's so amazing and like raw, it's like right there. So I said, come over here. So I grabbed a Bible out of the back, Bible reading plan. I'm like, like, like a guy trying to show you your investments. Hey, you got to do this here, do this. And, and after 10 minutes, I gave her a plan to how to read the Bible. We're always, that's what next steps will do. Stacy, the whole team over there will do a great job. And then over the years, I've learned how to pray in ways that are not just about me. Because when I first became a Christian, I prayed a lot about me. And uh, it's always tempting to pray a lot about ourselves. But 
I learned to pray about others. And I had that Romans 12, 12 feeling where you have hope in your troubles. And we're here to help you to do that. Sundays, midweek Bible study, that's starting up. We're going to do the book of Revelation. Oh, you can't understand that. You will if you come on Thursdays. Small groups are starting up. I highly encourage you. These are all tools to help you grow. Discover classes. We have six discover classes. Um, just go to our lakeshorechurch.org slash discover, find out more. They're here to help you with the educational element of our faith. And then synergy prayer every Saturday for an hour, 930 to 1030. Will you grow like God wants you to grow? The church is here to help you. We'll provide every opportunity for you. We will ring the bell for dinner. You just have to come downstairs and eat. Nobody can say with a straight face, I went to Lakeshore and I didn't grow. I'm going to tell you, either you weren't listening or you weren't availing yourself because you have a lot of different things with a lot of different environments, a lot of different people, and lots of different schedules. I don't know how much more we could do there. And I I think uh, so many of you avail yourself of that. One more. The third benefit of living out the gospel is this. We will show others God's greatness through us, specifically through using our gifts. Now, a Christian who really knows that God has saved them and fully grows like God wants us to and is saving us will also show others God's greatness through how they live and how they use their gifts in the future that we're going to be saved. In fact, that's why God created us. Look at Ephesians 2.10. Now, um, this will not sound very brilliant, but Ephesians 2.10 follows Ephesians 2, 1 and 9. Isn't that amazing? I went to seminary to learn that. No, actually, I say that because Ephesians 2, 1 and 9 talks about Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, for you're a Christian, you're dead in sin. Ephesians 2, 4 to 9, how you become a Christian. And then verse 10 is after you become a Christian, look at what he says. For we are God's handiwork. It's, it's the only occurrence of this word in the Greek in the New Testament. It's the word poema. We get our word work of art or poem from it. We are God's work of art, poem, handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Remember that's what we said? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he says, God created us to do good works. That tells me it's natural. And then he determined that we were going to do these good works in advance. That also means it's predetermined. It's natural for us because God lives in us, and it's predetermined by God because he's got a plan for us. And I don't fully get it, but we, are, we have a free will, and we have a sovereign God. We have a God that predetermines, and we have humans with free will, and I don't understand the intersection. I just know both are true, if that makes sense. And then 1 Corinthians 12 explains the best way we show the work of God in us is by using our spiritual gifts. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7, where it says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. In other words, the moment you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit is the source of your spiritual gift. The moment you become a Christian, you have spiritual gifts. You may not know them, It takes time to discover them, but you have spiritual gifts the moment you believe. Then he says the same thing two other ways. There are different kinds of service, which is another way to express spiritual gifts, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. What's he saying? God's a source of spiritual gifts, and when you're showing God's love to others, you're just using these gifts. And then he gives us this final verse, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. A spiritual gift is a divine empowerment to do certain things well, to glorify God and help others. So we show God's greatness through our gifts. I'm not going to cover all the gifts. We cover this, by the way, in Discover Your Purpose. That's another one of those six Discover classes that we have. But some of you have the gift of teaching. Some of you have the gift of administration or organization. Others, the gift of leadership. You get in chaos and you go, no, 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 you fix everything. You're a leader. Some have the gift of evangelism. They just love telling other people about Jesus Christ. Some people have the gift of helping or mercy or encouragement or discernment, etc. Whatever they are, we use them to help others and bring glory to God. So, 
How will showing others God's greatness or using our gifts change us? And here's the last point, the future. It's a consuming anticipation of salvation. Living out the gospel, living out the good news, living out our salvation helps us anticipate the day we die. I, I look forward to the day I die. I don't look forward to um, dying. <laughs> Some people have looked forward to that day. But anyway, um, not me. But I look forward to seeing Jesus Christ. So watch this, because I want to summarize. We were saved. That was point one. We're being saved. That's point two. And we will be saved. That's point three. Look at Romans 5, 9. We will be saved. We are we're saved, being saved, going to be saved. The gospel is not just then. It's then, it's now, it's every second of our life. Thereafter. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10 says, so we make it our goal to please him. That is to show the gifts that he's given us. Whether we're at home in the body, that's our life on earth, or away from it. Now watch this, for we must all answer appear, excuse me, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? So that each of us may receive what is due for the things we have done while in the body that is on earth, whether good or bad. So we anticipate the future. Now here's the good thing. If you're a Christian, every good and bad thing is going to appear before the living God. Now if you're a Christian, thank God, what's going to happen to all the bad stuff? It's forgiven. It's apparently we're going to, it's going to come to the Lord's attention, but maybe so that we see it forgiven. But all the good things we do are going to determine our reward in heaven. And I want to live for that day. I live for that day. It's the day I live for. I want to hear, and I hope that my life will produce this from the Lord. I want to hear the Lord look at me on judgment day and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And for me, I suggest you make that your ambition in life. Is it, is it yours? I hope so. We're here to help you. It's called ready to serve. I already talked about discover your purpose. We'll teach you the gifts. Ready to serve once a month, right after services. Um, it's coming up soon. You'll find out how you can use your gifts in a unique way, in a unique place here at Lakeshore. Using my gifts to serve God is one of the most thrilling things I can tell you right now. You asked me 45 years ago, I'd say, that's, that's a bore job. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. So let me summarize as I land the plane here. The gospel, this is what I've been saying. The gospel is all about the good news of Jesus Christ. Two, we receive the gospel by faith that starts the salvation process. Three, when we truly become a Christian, we will know God saved us. We were saved. That's in the past. We will grow like God saved us to grow. We are being saved. That's in the present. And we will show that we are saved by using our gifts to help others and glorify God, that we will be saved, and that's the future. The gospel is three-dimensional. The past, right now, the future, if you know Jesus Christ. And then last, so the gospel is not just something you believe in in the past. It's something you live out every day. Does that make sense? The gospel. It's not just fire insurance from hell. It's a lifestyle that reflects heaven. And then here's the great news. This is the verse I started with. Let me give you the rest of it. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good pleasure. And here's what I want to say. God will help you do this. You can't do this alone. The Holy Spirit living in you, Jesus Christ living in you, God the Father living in you, he'll help you live it out. But it all starts with accepting Christ. Let's bow our heads. And I just want to ask you, um, there's a lot, this was probably the headiest, most, this was like drinking from a fire hydrant message today. And, uh, but every now and then, that's good. So first question I want to ask is, are you sure you have received the gospel? Are you 100% sure that you're a Christian? 
How do you know? You, you got to say that God is holy, completely holy. You have to acknowledge your sinfulness. It's not, you're not a kind of sinner. You're a total sinner. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to take your place. To pay for all of your sins, all the sins in the past, present, and future, because the gospel is past, present, and future. And then you have to believe it and receive it, and here's the key, by faith alone. If you believe that, say this, Jesus Christ, I believe all of that. Come into my life, forgive me, and help me know, grow, and show the gospel. And then lastly, for those of you who are Christians, I want to ask you, how well are you doing at knowing growing and showing. You know, sometimes Christians just show up, but they don't show out. And I want to ask you, if you're a Christian, are you living for Jesus Christ at full potential? If not, we're here to help. Father, I pray that this helps people understand the gospel a little better. In your name we pray. Amen.